Scene four, we are with Malcolm. Malcolm and the English are coming on. More, uh, more soldiers marching, big crowd on the stage, more of a sense of, okay, there are only a few people on the stage with Macbeth. There's a whole lot closing in with the English, so that's going to have a kind of visual uh, effect on the audience, and they'll understand, like, wow, Macbeth is strong, but is he really going to be able to outman all of those? And that uh, the, the key here is that Malcolm, the son of Duncan, comes up with the rather genius idea of camouflage, effectively, where everybody goes while standing in Burnham Wood, and just grab a couple of uh, grab a couple of branches off the trees and hold them in front of you so that you can hide behind them. And, and if uh, the guards at Duntonane are scanning around, they'll just see a bunch of a uh, bunch of trees out there. They won't see an approaching army or anything. They'll just see the trees and we'll be hiding behind it. But of course, those trees will be marching towards Duntonane because they are actually soldiers bearing the wood before them. So there is that prophecy torpedoed. And you can see everybody in the audience going, ah, ha, oh, wow, that's that. Um, that element of the prophecy has been stripped away. And uh, the audience can see that as a very significant development. Back to Macbeth, scene five. And we're told, enter Macbeth, Satan and soldiers with drums and colors. So now we're getting some uh, some more activity on Macbeth's side. It's not going to be just this huge army with all the flags and the drums and the marching and, and the crowds overwhelming poor lonely Macbeth. He is going to marshal his own. And of course, for dramatic purposes, you want that. You want the conflict. You don't want it to be simple and, okay, you got me. You want there to be... Uh, a dramatic fight at the end. That's, you know, that, that is the, the primary rule of, uh, of good guy, bad guy movies in, uh, in Hollywood. But here, of course, we get the uh, somewhat devastating news that Lady Macbeth has died. But it's let out kind of intriguingly, at least I find it, Macbeth hears women crying off stage, you know, screaming, wailing, He's like, yeah, what's all that racket? And he asks, what is that noise? And Satan <laughs> responds, it is the cry of women, my good Lord. Macbeth says, I have almost forgot the taste of fears. The time has been my sense would have cooled to hear the night shriek, and my fell of hair would at this without a dismal treatise rouse and stir as life were in it. I have supped full of horrors, direness, familiar to my slandering thought, cannot once start me. Which I find interesting because he's dwelling on his interior state. He's saying that I can't be moved by this. But is that him just saying it out loud? putting on a brave face and wondering something else on the inside. He hears screams of women off stage. Maybe he is wondering, what about Lady Macbeth? And you remember all of those sweet sentiments that he expressed to her. You remember their relationship and how integral it is to his sense of worth to his whole identity. And so he could be saying this uh, just to talk himself out of any anxiety. Is it like, well, is, is, is that my wife screaming or is somebody screaming around my wife? Is, is something wrong? Um, he has been so attuned to his wife throughout that I don't think it's too much to expect that he might have some misgivings, even if he is trying to pretend while wearing his armor that uh, none of this affects him. And Satan comes back in, the queen, my lord, is dead. And her, his reaction is, again, curious. She should have died hereafter. 
there would have been time for such a word. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps at this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. So much going on. There's so much going on. there. She should have died hereafter, the future. She should have died in the future. That sense of time is just ravaging him. That sense of, I know the future, or I shouldn't know the future, but I do. There would have been time for such a word tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow that plodding agonizing circular feeling of time always grinding him down creeps at this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time syllable syllable is a measure of language not time so you can go you can delve in pretty significantly into what uh shakespeare is writing about when he is writing about writing and some of the perils of it and the contrast between writing and time itself out out brief candle he wants more darkness. All our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. He sees the light as an enemy. He is trying to live in eternal darkness at this point. But of course, what is eternal darkness? Death. The tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury, hello, William Faulkner, signifying nothing, is a scathing assessment of nihilism. Uh, but also it is another signal that he's just not, well, it, it says that he cannot read the events around him. He cannot read life. He cannot find meaning within life, but also it signals his inappropriateness to rule. He can't be a good ruler if he sees no meaning in any of it. There's this horrible devolution from him from the beginning where he has been reduced to this point and he just sees it as all an, as an existential horror show, rejecting the idea that life has any meaning, that the world has any meaning, the universe has any divine design. This is a declaration of some kind of lack of faith. And he lets go of it. He just, he can't engage with that because his, his wife, whom he cares about so much, is gone. The messenger walks in and says, as I did stand my watch upon the hill, I looked toward Burnham and anon me thought the wood began to move. Macbeth reacts quickly and passionately to that liar and slave. He sees the wood coming. Macbeth says, if thou speakest false upon the next tree, thou shalt hang alive till famine cling thee. If thy speech be sooth, I care not if it, if it, if thou dost for me as much. I pull in resolution and begin to doubt the equivocation of the fiend that lies like truth. Fear not till Burnham Wood do come to Dunsinane. And now a wood come toward Dunsinane. Arm, arm and out. If this which he which he avouches does appear, there is no, there's nor flying hence nor tarrying here, I gin to be a weary of the sun light, and wish the estate or the world were now undone. Ring the alarm bell, blow wind, come wreck, at least we'll die with harness on our back. A rallying cry to go out there and fight for, as he admits, nothing. They run off stage, 
Malcolm comes on stage, another dramatic change. And notice how quickly these uh, these scenes are changing now. They are getting shorter and shorter, picking up the pace as we go. Drums and colors enter Malcolm Seward, Macduff, and the army in thought. Malcolm, now near enough, your leafy screens throw down and show like those you are. You worthy uncle shall, shall, shall with my cousin, your right noble son, lead our first battle. So it's just very quick exposition, them saying, all right, now you go over there, now you go over there. And, you're gonna win. and this scene itself doesn't really accomplish that much. Uh, it is not that necessary beyond that pacing and that alternating contrasting thing. So you can see here Shakespeare kind of making up like, okay, let's just say Malcolm comes in and gives some orders. And, and it shows the unifying force of the Scottish and the English working together. Sure, you can say that. But uh, it doesn't really accomplish much more than that. It is simply for the broader effect of the drama and the quickening pace because it is over in what 10 lines 